So good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. And I've just got a little slideshow here. We're going to spend, I think it's 45 minutes, right? You know, something like that. At least stay longer, do I? It's a little dark. Yes. But I think it's not one o'clock. We don't have to worry about falling asleep. Plus, the chairs aren't very comfortable either. So, I don't have a whole lot of them. All right. So, I'm sure we'll uh, find something to discuss and talk about. So, my name is Scott Stavis. And I think I've been here a couple of years already. I appreciate that. They keep asking me back. And my goal here, more than anything else, is to share news and information, not to tell you what to do, but to, to tell you what we see and what we know. And then so that you guys can go home and apply it to your world, your farm, your, your life, all those other kind of things so you can make good decisions. That's basically the, the gist of what we're doing. So if I accomplish that today, that would be my goal. Just to probably just tell you as much as I can so you guys can make good information and take that information back, make your guys' uh, life and farm operations a lot better. The, the thing that I, I have an advantage over you is, is I live in the auction world. And if you don't believe me, it's true. That's the only thing I'm going to tell you. In the auction world, we're always the first to see. It's true. It's just like well, why do people sell their cattle at sale barns in? So it's true price discovery, right? It's the very first. Cash is king, all those other kind of things. So in the auction world, we see things. Uh, they get reported six months later because it takes that long for it to trickle through and make it newsworthy. And then everybody thinks, oh, that's good. You guys, all you got to do is follow auction sales. You folks that uh, aren't looking at a lot of familiar faces, although I don't get to see you anymore because we don't do hardly any live auctions. But my point being is you folks and your farm families that have attended auctions over the years, and watch what happens in the auction world. I know for a fact that you've taken those besides buying good machinery, you've taken that information and used it and applied it to your, to your farming operations, and I guarantee you it did be good. So that's one of the things that I also wanted to tell everybody about. And we'll see if that becomes true. So just make sure I get that. Yeah, the, there it goes. So we have a few slides in the beginning to give you a little bit of perspective, and then after that. It's going to be mostly just talking about. I always tell everybody that if I can if I can get three things in your head when you leave, that's a that's a good thing. And you know, I always like to my my wife always reads books and she always reads the end first. I don't watch the end. Anybody else have one of those? So anyway, um, pretty much as far as the, what I wanted to do, I'm going to tell you right now. You know, from a land and machinery perspective, as we sit for 2024, you know, basically 2024 is going to be a continuation of what's been happening the last 2022, 2023, with the exception is that the tops are in. The tops occurred in the fall of 2022 and the spring of 2023. And since the spring of 2023, it's more of a run out, if that makes any sense to you. In other words, not really a whole lot's changed. The exception is, is that the reality of what happens in the marketplace is starting to come to fruition. So 2024, in my mind, is going to be a run out of what's been happening in 2023, but the tops are in, which is, a, you know, especially if you're on the buy side, especially when it comes to real estate, it's, it's going to be nice to get a bit of a reprieve. And then you don't have to open up the paper or go to the cafe and, and say, what did that one bring? And you know, of course, and that's been the conversation for the last up since about 2019, 2020, when Trump got all his money to get started for the farm operations and things of that nature. So that, that's what I'd like to leave you with as much as anything else. So if you walk out the door, say, hey, you know, what's the secret sauce for 2024? The shooting market is gonna just be pretty much the way it is right now. There's might be the, the only difference is that I think that there's gonna be Finally, a bit more separation that we haven't seen in the last three or four years because supply's been so short between the really good stuff and the stuff that brought too much. Does that make sense? So that separation that's that's going to that hasn't been in place. So in other words, why does an eight thousand dollar tractor bring nearly as much as a twenty five hundred dollar tractor? It doesn't make any sense. But that's kind of what's happening. That separation is going to start coming uh, more in, in in favor especially on uh, equipment that uh, has a lot more wear and tear than say, for example, the tractor. So that would be one thing that I would say, say is, and then also on the land, on the land side, you're gonna see the tops in, but 
You're also going to see some really continued strong prices on the really high quality land or the land that's in tightly held areas. But you're also going to see, and we've already seen as much as 10 or 15 percent of, uh, uh, of a drop off the, the crazy highs um, that occurred in the fall of 2022 and the spring of 2023. And then marginal land or that lesser value land or that less productive land is going to really start seeing some separation as far as valuation that we haven't necessarily seen in the marketplace. So that's those are the things that I'd like to leave you with before we even start. So put that to memory, knock on the door, everything else I said, don't know that. So anyway, so company, see if I remember which button was. Is the word remote is? It's the right button, right? It's, it's this one right here, right? Work before. There you go. Shh, you're giving away. Okay, I'm okay. Maybe I don't. Just as slow. What if I just do this? What if I just do this? I just walk over. It gives me something to do. So there you go. So anyway, my dad founded our auction company in 1960. He passed away on November 23rd of this year. He was 86 years old. He started our company, been to a lot of sales. He and I traveled down the road together and found this. But our company's changed dramatically since he first started, just like your farm operations have uh, changed dramatically. You know, when I graduated from college in NDSU in 1984, we decided to start a business and there was three of us, my mom, my dad, and me. Then we hired my aunt, Jerry. And now we're about 130, 135. And just like you guys in the farm operations, it just uh, we view growth as a defensive strategy. So in 2023, we sold 1,498 tractors, 485 combines, 1,203 trucks, 1,678 trailers, and 26,000 acres of farmland. We had 546 auction events across 18 states, which included California, Colorado, Iowa, Idaho, all those states down there. It's crazy. My dad told me one thing 40 years ago, and he said, just remember this. The death of distance. What is he talking about? That's a nice cliche that we use in our world. Um, and uh, and most of this is an ag. A lot, some of it's in construction. But uh, for example, we sold 15 quad tracks uh, for a Case IH dealer in uh, Southern California. Uh, they they were big into scraper tractors like Matichex are in Minnesota, and they just they placed the largest order in Case IH's history for quad track replacements. And they had about, I don't know, maybe it was 20 of them that we sold down there. It's just amazing how things have changed. So anyway, this facility that we just opened last year is in LaSalle, Colorado. I don't need, I didn't even know where LaSalle was, but it's just northwest of the Denver airport. And this facility is primarily in the construction and the oil and gas world that supports what we're doing in our other locations as far as uh, Williston is concerned. We do do a lot of ag in Williston. Of course, there's a bunch of large farms northwest of Williston along the High Line there. Um, and again, they, their, their farm operations are the same as ours, but yet they're completely different. In other words, they farm you know, 18,000 acres, and they do it with one air drill, two tractors, a couple combines. Pretty much that's about it. It's funny how that works. And most of those guys up there that are farming that land are all in their mid 60s to 80s. And there isn't very many people in there to take their place. And that's another thing that we can talk about as we move forward. Some of the things that agriculture from a perspective of what, what to see in the future. We also, this year, uh, our auction, auction business is changing just like farm operations are changing. Everybody's getting bigger. And, and uh, so Heartland Auction was a little uh, startup in Garden City, Kansas. Uh, we, we sold tractors to Kansas for decades. And that area down there is a big irrigated area. Lots of, a lot of farms very similar to what you guys have here, except for they use pivots because it doesn't, doesn't rain and it gets to be 90 for like 44 weeks in a row. So anyway, we're, we're there, uh, matches up our LaSalle, Colorado. That's an ag facility. And then Bear Auction Services in Mesa City, Iowa. Um, again, um, Dennis is 72 years old. His son passed away, who was his successor in a terrible accident. And uh, so we're, and we already had a facility in Mesa City. So that's the reason that we're there. Okay. So again, just kind of 
reiterate what we talked about. Land markets is stable, the tops are in for now. And unless something changes in those three leading indications, you guys, how many people were here last year? Remember what I said about leading indicators? What are they? Interest rates, crop production, and commodity prices. And the fourth one that's becoming more and more evident, and especially the Trump bump. You guys remember the Trump bump? Government. Government's the other one because it changes everything. So anyway, machinery markets are stable, correcting more so with seasonal changes. Here's another thing that I want to leave you with in terms of marketing. If you're a seller, not a buyer, sell your planters in the spring and buy four wheel drives in the summer. Because you know, then and if you're a if you're a seller or a buyer, buy your full yeah, I already told you that on the other side of it, sprayers, buy sprayers in the uh, sell sprayers in the spring and and buy them in the fall. The seasonal changes are going to be very much more evident as we move forward and it's more of a normalcy that comes together. That's when the highest prices are combined up. December. Can you believe it? It's changed. And again, if you're going to if you're going to uh, sell a combine, um, probably want to sell it in December. Not and not. And if you didn't want to sell it in December. Sell it in September, not July. We always seem to say, guys sell combines in July right ahead of the harvest. Well, guess what? There is no harvest in July anymore. You know, you got some canola and things of that nature, but everything is corn and soybeans all the way up to Winnipeg. So September is when you want to, you know, market a combine or December or December. But, and the two-year-old trading thing really works out really well. So, and again, watch those leading indicators because they will tell you everything. And if you want to know the single most greatest influencer, to farm machinery values is one thing and one thing only, commodity prices. Because commodity prices trump interest rates and crop production every every which way in Sunday. And the reason for that being is you can't depend on crop production from what you see driving down the road because it's a much bigger world in today's area. So you might be in a crop failure perspective. Meanwhile, there's a bumper in Southeast Iowa and so that doesn't really change that much. It's more of a holistic thing from a production point of view, but it's probably the least effective. And then, of course, on the other side of it, interest rates are a significant one. And of course, interest rates, we haven't seen the correction that's going to occur yet in interest rates because there's too much exuberance out there. And that exuberance in the cash is diminishing. And you're going to start seeing that and we kind of already have uh, when it comes to land values. So keep that in mind. And I'll tell you, and I'll show you uh, proof of what I just told you because it's happened before. It has, yes, and we'll we'll talk about that. So here's my little slide for you: interest rates, commodity prices, crop production, and I added government payments. As much as I hate to admit it, 21 percent of farm income, and when we got the Trump bump and the, everybody had corn out that winter, remember that was a 2020 20, 20, 20, 20% of farm income came from the government that year. I didn't put the slide in because it's old, but that's what happened. Price of new equipment, availability of new equipment, and availability of used equipment are some of the other factors. People always say, well, how can you afford a $400,000 four-wheel drive? And I, I bet we sold 25 tractors this year for over $400,000. It's the craziest thing you've ever seen. But my dad... And we were sitting there visiting and goes, you know, I remember when we used to sell 4430s for 15000 and hit a home run. You guys remember that? So we do. And I guess that's just part of that whole deal. And in today's world, why are used tractors bringing four hundred and five hundred thousand dollars Because new ones cost $858,308 or more. And uh, has anybody seen or heard anything about gear lowering the prices? Just asking. Just asking. So there you go. That then again, it goes back to that rule that we always talk about, that 50% of new rule. And utility is everything. And I, I think that's the equation that you guys got to remember. And that explains why combines aren't holding their value as well as tractors are. Because they don't have the utility, right? So anybody know what the rated capacity of a new X9 John Deere 1100 is? On high that or high bushel corn, seven thousand two hundred bushels an hour. Look it up on their web page. Seventy two hundred bushels an hour in X 9 1100 of So 
you put a 10 hour day in, you put 72, theoretically, you put 72,000 bushels of corn in the band in one day. One day. For you, a lot of you guys, I don't know when I grew up, we, well, first of all, we didn't raise much corn, but and that's a whole crop. So again, it's all about capacity. And of course, the 90, 9230, right? Those IHS, big one, the class nine that they have, not quite as big, but pretty close. So again, it goes back to that same old, same old thing. 50% um, of rule, you guys want to know what your, your stuff is worth? 50% of new. It's been the case since the cows come home. So if you can buy a new tractor for $80,000, there's a really, really good market for a $40,000 tractor in the used market. I don't care what year it is or, what year, or anything of that nature. It's all about condition and utility. Just remember that. You guys in the life, how many people have cows or livestock here? And you guys are the last of the whole weekends. <laughs> but again, from a livestock perspective, you can, when you're talking about livestock equipment, you can say 80%. People always ask me, like, you know, calls on the phone about livestock equipment. He says, hey, I'm looking for a feeder, or I'm looking for a new stock trailer. And he, and he goes, you got any coming up? And I said, yeah, I do. You really want my advice? Don't tell anybody, because this kind of, kind of goes against what I should be saying. Go buy a new one. Go buy a new one. It's just, I mean, the difference between used and new and the livestock deal, it's amazing. You, you can sell a 35-year-old gate for 85 bucks, and you can buy a new one for 115 as long as it didn't bend. I'm kind of stop it. But anyway, that's that's unique and interesting in the farm or the, the livestock world. And the big problem in the livestock industry that, that that's going to be a huge problem as we move forward, multi-generational farm families is still in the livestock business. The, the problem that the livestock people have, you know, we talk about livestock in general. So you got first of all poultry. Uh, you got swine, you got dairy, and you got beef cattle, right? Basically, that's livestock in a nutshell. Did I miss anything? Okay, so how long has the poultry industry been integrated in the United States? In other words, when I say you guys know what integrated means, so people own the chickens from the start to finish, including the processor, or they're all integrated. Poultry's been integrated since 19, what, 60, 70, somewhere in there. Swine. If you don't believe me, the swine's been completely and totally integrated and commoditized. Just go to Southeast Iowa and see seven hog sheds on every section of land, each one of them containing 2,500 head. And there isn't one of those pigs in any of those barns that are owned by the guy that's feeding. Just the way it is. So poultry, swine, been commoditized, right? Dairy, what's going on in dairy? I can tell you, we sold probably. 8,000 head of dairy cattle this year, mostly in Wisconsin. And remember when the dairy buyout in 88 took place and all the 60 and 50 cow dairies all got bought out and everybody put 500 head parlors in? Well, guess what? All those 500, 1,200, 800 head parlors, they're all getting bought out because 65 year old people own them and they survived it and made good living. And, and the Fair Family Riverview is just one example, you know. How many cows do they have going? I think 150,000. Most of the dairies that are going in right now are in that 3,500 to 7,000 head range. That's what they're doing. Okay, so there's the third one that's commoditized, right? I hate to say it, but it's true. First District Association's got their cheese plant in Litchfield, Minnesota, which is where our yard is. They've tripled their capacity in the last eight years. And it's all basically down to, and yet their producer lists are down to, I don't even know what the count is. It's probably about 25% of what it was, say, 15 years ago. Less stops. As you guys know, when my dad started in the auction business in 1960, Cass County, North Dakota, don't quote me on this exactly, I think it was 323 dairy stops in Cass County, North Dakota. And everybody had cows, right? Well, guess how many there are this year? Now, zero. There's no third family, I think, was the last one. So, again, and now you got Qualls in Lisbon that put you know, $27 million into a robotic dumping system. So guess what? There is what? Completely commoditized. Or if it hasn't been, it will be. So what do we got left? The livestock industry, the cow-calf operator. Guess what? Cow-calf operators will never, ever be commoditized. You want to know why? Ain't enough money in it. The other side of it is, 
the husbandry in terms of you know raising the calf and you know taking care of a cow and getting to get to clean the heifers and all those other kind of things. That's going to change. But here's the big problem in the livestock industry. It's going to be almost impossible to be able to afford the land because you know a cow calf operator can't afford. And what's happening is you know in the real estate school we always talk about highest and best use, right? But what's the highest and best use becoming for pasture? Recreation. And when you're talking about somebody that lives in Denver, Colorado, that wants to go out and chew milk, or somebody that wants to hunt pheasant, or you know, not to be disparaging or anything else, they won't step on cow bars. They don't have to. And so that's going to be the biggest problem in the cow calf operator perspective. And I and then it'll be interesting to see your your future's bright if you can survive. You want to know why? Because the American consumer, no matter how hard they try, Still loves beef. That's the bottom line. I mean, you can eat a turnip burger all you want, but you know, it's just it's going to be bad. So, and the other side of it is these large feedlots. So, Garden City, Kansas, uh, a mile and a half south of town, there's a I think it's thirty-eight thousand head feedlot. And most of the feedlot operators in today's world, they recognize, know, and understand that they cannot have those cattle in those feedlots more than hundred days doesn't work because they cannot support the husbandry. So you folks in the feeding business that want to do backgrounding and things of that nature, you know, your, your future is really bright. All you got to do is be able to make sure you can stand new chores. I used to find oh boy, you got to do chores. That's, that's my, that's my vision to the future. I don't know if you agree with it or not, but there you go in the livestock side. Utility is driving older machinery values proportionately higher. It's the 50% of new rule. It hasn't changed. And why don't combines track? Because the utility isn't the same. So it takes what, 588 20s to put 7,000 bushels an hour into a into a uh, cart, probably, maybe six if they break down all the time. I just dated myself with my talking about the points. Anyway. Challenges for production agriculture, besides what I just talked about, your biggest challenge moving forward is going to be labor. Labor. 100%. And you know what the solution to that is? Autonomy. Autonomy is going to be the solution as much as anything. And then, of course, the H2A programs and all those other kinds of things. I really feel that in the, in the, the next generation, in the next 10 years, agriculture is going to become cool. So you guys, you guys get that to look forward to. You might see anybody that's got an operator here that's got a 30-year-old or younger in your operation, you tell them that you just hang in there because agriculture is going to be cool. I really believe that. And of course, they all talk about, uh, you know, organic or pick something. At the end of the day, that when people get a little more educated and they want to get closer to farming, some of that will go away because the recognition and the common sense of all that that's going on right now is starting to start to be raised. That the awareness is going on there. Pretty soon, that, that's going to be great. So you farm families that have farmland and things of that nature, you just hang on to it. And, and as, far, as far as agriculture is concerned, um, there are just lots and lots of uh, what I would consider to be optimism in the ag world as we go through and, and into the next generation, especially with all the upheaval in the world. As it goes on, people are going to start to recognize how important food is, and more and more because the cheap food, you know, what, what we always talk about in the 80s and the 90s cheap food policy, right? Cheap, remember, Flint was president, cheap food policy, we had all subsidies and all that. That's changed dramatically because you can go to a grocery store and people will pay five dollars for a bundle of broccoli because it says organic on it, and they won't pay a dollar fifty. Or one that's not. There you go. There's my proof. People pay $21 a pound, or it's more than average, but probably $45 a pound to eat a prime rib wagyu. Half of them don't even know what it means. Half of them more than anything else. Let me tell you a story. It's okay because we've got lots of time. So, anybody okay eat Pittsburgh Blue? Have you heard of Pittsburgh Blue? It's like a steakhouse chain in Minneapolis. So, I'm sitting there. Of course, I was raising the ranch and New and five gallon peat buckets were just like the rest of you guys in the next step world. And uh, this nice, pretty young lady comes up, her selling 50 to $60 steaks, or whatever else, not looking at it. And she goes you know, into her spiel and she goes, 
And by the way, the prime rib is the finest cut of the cow. It's grass fed and no antibiotics. And my wife is just like, this. Oh, grass fed cow. You guys are serving cow. Huh? USDA prime doesn't mean anything to you, anything like that. And, and, and by the way, doesn't that mean you're selling me the skinny sick ones? <laughs> oh, she was bad. <laughs> I did. I did. You can call Kelly up and ask her. She's still mad at me about that. You know, the, the, the fortunate part about it is, is that nice, pretty young lady? She just put a smile on her face and she didn't have a clue. <laughs> didn't even know what I was talking about. Anyway, Pittsburgh Blue is a pretty good restaurant, though. Anyway. Um, late model farm equipment is going to stay steady as new availability and price increases justify the expense all the way through the end of 2024. Crop production might have an influence on that, um, but I doubt it just because there's still some strong out demand. The other side of it is, is that, you know, back in the 80s, it didn't take anything of uh, going to a farm sale and a farmer was retiring and uh, his 4840 had 12,000 hours on it or his uh, 875 Versatile had 9,000 hours on it, was on its second set of tires and they were wore out. Then they're done that, right? And in today's world, you know, you go on to most of these farms and, you know, these R tractors got 1,800 hours. I said, don't oh, choose, that's a lot of hours. It's past the power guard. See how that's different? Yeah. And again, I think that we're probably going to end up going a little bit more back to that, but not yet, because there's still that strong demand for forecast, everything else. And again, from technology perspective, it's changing everything. We talk about autonomy as well. Let me read you something. There's a quote from the president of John Deere. I took it, I took it from their uh, earnings call. Our goal is by 2030, in certain production systems, if a grower so chooses to be able to offer a fully autonomous production system all the way through from spring tillage and planting all the way through harvest. Okay, that's what you're saying. I guess I'll say, see, that's 15 years from now, fully integrated from start to finish. Yeah, so, and, and in today's world, as you think about theoretically, from an autonomy perspective, um, theoretically, everything is in place as we sit today. They just haven't uh, introduced it to the marketplace yet. And, and you guys have got RTK, and it's an eight inch or something like that. I don't know how they're going to manage the, you know, the what happens at the, Deer dies in front of you and you plug your fire up. You know, I think there's so many things that I'm sure that are in between. But again, autonomy is going to change agriculture as we move forward, especially when it comes to the mundane, fall tillage and all those other kind of things. I don't know from a precision perspective, it might be a little difficult to autonom uh, autonomize planting, for example, or spraying. But Deer's new sprayer has a sensor on it where it will find the weeds. And it's got multiple uh, tanks, so it'll spray different chemicals depending on what the sprayer sees at, a, at uh, what is it, eight and a half miles an hour? The pace. So technology is going to change everything. But as far as machinery is concerned, demand will depend on commodity prices and to a certain degree crop, crop production. But again, I don't see anything changing from the machinery market, maybe 5%, something like that. A separation in terms of valuations from the really good stuff to the stuff that's a little tougher. You folks, you know, buy machinery sheds, put your machinery in the shed. Here's another thing that you guys can be proud of. We're in Devil's Lake, North Dakota. And one thing that I've discovered in the 49 years that I've been in the auction business and, you know, our, our growth in terms of where we're seeing it, you want to see the best machinery, the, the, the most, the highest quality, the best condition, the best prices of any machinery anywhere in the United States, it's here. Here in the Red River Valley and here in North Dakota. And to a certain degree, 50 miles east as we go into Minnesota. This is it. Everybody wants to buy your machinery. So you guys are in a very good end yield position. You're the highest in the food chain. You really are. So congratulations. And you know, everybody wonders, well, how come that is? Well, first of all, you guys like big devil's lake. Pretty cold in the wintertime. You know, we got what 10 days to harvest and 10 days to plant. The rest of the time it sits in the shed. You want to get a, a realization, you farm guys that are out here, you know, it's like, come on, boys, we gotta go. It's not quite ready yet, but we're gonna go anyway. 
in Iowa and Illinois, man, the kids got a basketball game starts at 4 30. Yeah, I might come back tomorrow. Seriously, it's just an old different world. Does that planning dates? I mean, they can start putting fertilizer down in February in, in southeast Iowa. We do it all the time. If they're ambitious, or they got a lot of land to cover. It's just a different world, completely different world. Farmland values. Here's just a little slide I put together. Um, you know, there's $10,000 an acre land in North Dakota in quite a few areas right now. If you were to say Red River Valley from a, from a market perspective, if you wanted to pick a number that was somewhere close, I'd tell you it was probably 6,500 as we sit here today. And, you know, the, the, the list would be sh pretty short or CRP or water or something like that to get into the pores, even here in Devil's Lake. Some of the highest priced land is places that it used to be the, the lowest price, $6,500 an acre up here by Harvey. That crazy. These are all verified sales that we did. Here's potato ground, fourteen thousand in the River Valley. So, again, uh, here's twenty five hundred ten dollars an acre. And you know, guys, where that is, right? You know what that land is? That's called walking around ground. You know what that means? It's only good for walking around on it. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, the, the recreational value kind of just uh, certifies, goes back. You know, if uh, a guy works in town, he's got a professional job um, and he wants a good piece of land, which everybody does, right? He'll pay three to five thousand dollars an acre and not have to worry about uh, revenue. As long as it's below, say, a half million dollars. Because they just bought a lot in town to build a house on and it cost them 250. You got a little square. It's all about perspective. So anyway, that, that's kind of what we're seeing. Again, talk about the increases in value. I just pulled this slide really quick because I didn't uh, didn't know. But here from 2022 to 2020, two years, you talk about a run of 60 percent increase in farmland that I deemed very comparable about six miles apart in a two year time period. So I mean, you guys probably see that here in your markets if you're to expose land. It's off again, probably since the spring of 2023. but. That's really what happened from a run-up perspective, and there's a, a perfect data-driven example of what I'm speaking of that you guys can relate to. This is by Arthur, North Dakota, which is 35 miles northwest of Fargo, right on Highway 18. Pretty good land there. Why is farm real estate in such demand? Because it's been such a wonderful investment. You know, and bottom line, again, farmers have cash, and then the established operations are making room for the next generation. That's I, I added that slide about a year ago. And guys my age and older, or guys that are probably 10, 15 years younger than me, that wasn't the case. You guys know that. Look around the room. And finally, finally, we're starting to see young people come back to farms. So when people come to pay for their tractors or pay for the machinery, um, we're, we're starting to see some younger faces, which is wonderful. You want to know why? Because they see opportunity. Hey, it's free market. They're recognizing it. You know, farming has been profitable. So there you go. Here's another reason why farm real estate is such a bad demand, because farmers value land above all else. If you've never heard me speak before, I'm going to say it again. When somebody comes to me personally, or my son, or anybody in our auction business, and they say, hey, I want to sell some real estate, our first response to most of them is, don't ever sell farmland. And if I can, if I can give you another piece of advice, if you guys are farm families here, don't ever sell farmland. Now, the problem with that is, is that it's not realistic. But that's my, my, my opinion. And when I when I say that, some sound surprised. My immediate response is after that, if I don't think like that, how am I going to represent you and get as much money for that land as, as you think I get that it's worth? Because I really truly believe that. If you, your farm families, anybody, if you look at Europe, if you look at multi-generational operations, you know, land will always take care of you. Now, there's some problems with that that we're going to talk about as we go forward. And the reason that land is traded and is sold, because obviously we can't own it forever. But continued trend of larger machinery, so more cap capacity needed to justify. I always wonder if that's a chicken and an egg story. Well, what, what happened first? Did land become more valuable? Or everybody wants to buy more land because they see all this machinery out there and they got to get more. 
because it's uh, to justify the machinery, or is it because, hey, they're building all this big machinery, I got to get more land to justify it? See what Tim's saying? I don't know what he means. I don't know if there's a real answer. I think it's a true chicken and egg story. I really do. But that's what's happening, and that's the reason. But again, back to my X9 example, or my 16 year old miner compared to a four year old. Can you know what check wire is? You guys do. Yeah. You've come a long way, haven't you? Yeah. Anyway, so there you go. That's my opinion. Why is farm real estate been an outside funds entering the market due to limited alternative investments? Here's something that I predicted last year as we're sitting here. More investor buying farmland. They're going to outbid farmers. And it, it occurred, especially this fall. Wealthy individuals have no ties to agriculture are still buying farmland. We've sold more farmland to investors this fall than we did probably in the last two years combined. And the reason for that being is they're outbidding new farmers. And the reason they're outbidding new farmers is because. And you guys know that. Now, the difference with that is, is when land comes across the road and you got cash. And so anyway, that, that's kind of what's happening. And we did see a lot of farmers buying land out of their farming area just to stay in the marketplace so that when something came up for sale across the road, they could, they could justify the expense. In other words, they were in the market. There wasn't anything else there that would, that would keep pace with what was going on in the marketplace. Here's another thing, and we can talk about it just briefly. 3% is the goal, but now cash is worth 5% or more. Do you know what I'm talking about here? That's cash rents. So if you want to know what a cash rent is or what people from an investment perspective or what, what the world is revolving around, and I don't care if it's in Illinois or, or Nebraska or anything of that nature, the number is 3%. So in other words, if my land's worth $10,000 an acre, I want 300 bucks to make your cash on. Does that make sense? And 3% is a pretty good number. It's kind of like my 50% of new rule. So in the Red River Valley, if you got $7,000 an acre land, you know, cash rent's going to be 210 bucks. I know there's a lot of guys still paying 130 or 170, but there's markets at 210, pretty regular, and there's guys paying 275 just to be able to get control of the land. But that's a good number. And that number has been pretty much the same for a long, long time. And this is another thing that's going to slow the farm real estate market down. Because a lot, almost all farmland from an investor perspective is almost always bought with cash. It really is, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. But and the reason for that being is because back when it was running up, we could only get a half a percent from a money market perspective or a CD. Well, now CDs are over five. So it's taking some of those older farm land buyers out of the marketplace. So again, that, that's that's a little bit that's changed, but at the same time, there's still there's still a lot of guys that are very comfortable in that three percent range. And some of those really tightly held areas in Illinois, um, where land is twenty thousand dollars an acre, they're still only getting three hundred and fifty bucks an acre for cash rent. But they're okay with it because they get to own the farmland and they know that it's going to appreciate. So, so that's kind of what here, here in Devil's Lake, you know, 175 bucks an acre. Does that ring a bell to a lot of you guys? Probably, probably where I'd see it. It's kind of a big number. Remember when we used to be able to rent land uh, by Carrington for 28 bucks an acre? Yeah. Well, that was before Roundup and Rock Rollers. Oh. And so I mean, it and it changed everything. So anyway. Uh, here we go. Mortgage rates. Here's another deal from an interest perspective. I find this this graph fascinating because yeah, interest rates are high, but look at it. It's a 30 year mortgage rate. And here we are today. And everybody thinks it's going to come down a little bit. And I do too, just because it's an election year. But if you go like this and draw a straight line. Across, where are we? We're way low even today. So again, don't look for things to really change too much. Here, here's uh, 85, right? And I'll show you a slide here next. So and that, that's really interesting. I find it very interesting. And yeah, we, we had this big bullet here, but this one's crazy. 
Do you know the six? What day I saw a slide the other day. Sixty-two percent of the nation's home mortgage uh, loans are less than three percent. Do you think those people are going to buy houses? No way. Only get rid of the mortgage at three, and we got to come in with seven and pay twice as much for the same house. So it's math, plain and simple. The problem is the math hasn't been quite recognized yet, but it will. What do you expect land values will retract considering current interest rates, exception to highly productive, high quality dirt, and a much slower rate of rise? And, I, and again, this is this is my personal opinion. You guys have been following what, what we talk about. I'm pretty sure I'm right. 2024 will be a run on. Don't forget, it took 20 years to correct in Iowa from the 80s collapse. And you can say the same thing here in North Dakota. About 20 years. 85 was the bottom. 2005 is when things start taking off. And again, and all you got to do is go back. I didn't, I didn't include the slides to prove my my data, but that's that's kind of what happened. And you guys that lived it, I think I might be off a year or two. Depends on what you think. But anybody, anybody disagree with that? So eight years to correct after the 2012 thing. When Obama got elected in 2012, from basically November 1st to the end of December, land doubled. All every auction event that we did that fall, it was just nuts. Land that we thought was going to bring $5,000 an acre brought nine within a three month time period. It was crazy. And spring of 2013 was still really good. And then all of a sudden, the realities of 14, 15, and 16 took place. All those guys bought all that new machinery and uh, 179 deduction, traded dad's combine in, bought a $500,000 combine, traded dad's 100,000 in, so they did that. So they had 400,000, but they took the $250,000 tax deduction. So they owe 400,000 on the combine and suddenly were 300, and they have a $100,000 tax liability against it as well. Remember that? Yeah, so we're, we're not there, but you got to remember this, the interest rate peaked. In the spring of 1981 at 18.63%, yet land prices did not bottom until 1985. Took that long. And again, as we sit here today, I'm you know, by no means whatsoever saying gloom and doom in the real estate market. That is not what I'm saying because 1985 was way different than today. You want to know the number one reason? No debt. 85 was all about collateral lending, all about debt. And we just don't have that issue. Over 80% of Iowa farmland is unencumbered. North Dakota doesn't have a statistic that uh, that proves that, but Iowa State spent the time and money to do those uh, surveys. 80% of Iowa farmland is unencumbered. That's pretty cool when you think about it. We have something like $3.6 trillion in money markets in the United States as we sit today. It's the highest number that we've ever had in the history of our country. Most of it's funny. So anyway, again, it's different, but yet at the same time, the math has to make sense. So here's the thing in the real estate side. The number one problem in real estate and agriculture, especially for you farm families, is solution. You know what that means, right? Too many people own the same land. An undivided one sixteenth interest because it was grandpa's land and he had three kids and they had five each and all of a sudden 18 people own the same land. And it's really starting to be a problem in Illinois and Iowa and Missouri and some of those places where farm families have been in for six or seven generations. We haven't seen it up here in the Dakotas quite as bad yet, but that's going to be the number one problem. How do you how do you pass on the land? You know, guys came here into the Dakotas and sell homesteaders. Um, most of them are German and Norwegian descent, right? Right. Well, why did they come here? The land, right? Isn't that it's true? And you remember that if you weren't the oldest in the farm family, I don't care how smart you were or how hard a worker you were, you weren't going to get the land because you weren't the oldest. That's how we did it back then. We don't do it that way here, do we? Oh, we got to you know, the money side of it, whatever else. And again, I don't have the solution or the problem or, or tell you what to do or anything of that nature. I'm sure you all got lawyers and tax accountants and all those other kind of things from a planning perspective, but. The number one problem that we see in agriculture from a generational perspective is how do you pass the wealth? The other side of it is when is government going to wake up and start getting greedy and try to take it from it? Because that's the other side of the equation, right? 
And if you study your history, one or the other is going to occur. So anyway, so right now, 60% of farmland is owned by people 65 years and older, and only 2% of farmland is owned by people 35 years and younger. And I don't know if that's such a scary thought, because you know, who can afford to buy farmland when you're 35? Unless you inherit it or something like that. I don't know if that's so scary, but it's again, it's something that has to be has to be recognized and understood. And again, from a perspective of how you do that from a farm family point of view, passing those on and still keep your family together. Because there's been some nasty wrecks when it comes to families as far as passing farmland and, and all that kind of stuff. I don't even, that's a whole other subject. But a slower rate of rise, plateauing with rising interest. And as soon as interest rates came down or commodity prices come up, then we're going again, boys. When you get higher, always has, always will. So don't be afraid. The other side of the equation is, is that when land comes up for sale across the road and you have cash, you got to buy it. If you want to stay in the farm world, you got to buy it. That's what my grandpa told me. The hard part is, you got to remember, when homesteaders came here in North Dakota, right? Settled North Dakota, how much did they pay for the land? They got it free. They got it free. No problem was it cost them eight bucks an acre to break it. So when, when they got land for free as homesteaders, half of them went broke. They got the land for free. Think about it. And in today's world, land is always too high. It always has been and always will be. Just, and again, that's hard to swallow. But land has always been too high. It doesn't matter when it was 100 bucks an acre, or 300 or 3,000 or 30,000. It's always going to be too high, boys and girls. So here's the trick. You've got to figure out a way to pay for it. And the problem is, is that it can't be debt. It can't be debt. Or very little. Because it just doesn't work. What did I show you in the deal before? 3%. Well, if I'm paying, I'm paying farm credit 7.5, and, and, you know, it's 3. Well, I've got a D and no, I didn't get a D, but I've got a C in math. But even I figured that out. So there you go. I'm just pointing out. I'm not giving you any solutions or problem or, or understanding of what to do, but I'm just telling you that's what the problem is. Okay, fair enough. What do you expect to see in the future? Here, here's something that uh, that's really hard for me to understand, and and it changes dramatically. So August first, in our company, our sales volume for the year was down 27 percent in the farm machinery world. There's nothing to sell, and we finished the year up about four, four or five. And 2022 was a pretty good year. And guess what it was? Dealer inventory. We we sold more dealer inventory from October 1st to last week. From October 1st, I'm gonna tell you what the number is, but it was big. And more more dealer inventory from October 1st to December 31st, and we sold in the previous, I used to say three years, but we did the math. We sold more dealer inventory from October 1st to December 31st than we have in the previous six years combined. Bottom. And if you guys have been following our website, you see, I mean, there was a bunch. I don't know how many combines we sold in our, our tractors. And the funny part about it is almost unanimously green it wasn't red. I don't know if that's because of Titan, you know, in the markets that we operate, or also that numbers aren't nearly the same. I mean, the disparaging production numbers between deer and cases, I don't know what they exactly are, but it's, it's, it's not proportional, it's disproportional. But, and again, the, the, the part about that that's really interesting is, is that all, all that machinery got absorbed. And when you consider the amount that was put into the marketplace, that was really surprising for us. It really was. But again, that, that was, uh, and we didn't know anything about that or didn't, didn't expect it all the way up till the 1st of September. But again, beer runs a tight ship. Never bet against beer. Another world of advice. But always watch the leading indicators and the dealer inventory. The reason that they sold so much this year is because they had a pile up on the deer side. Those guys were doing trades, but guess what? The guys that did the trades couldn't get their couldn't get their equipment, right? Maybe have maybe have that experience here. Guys order a planner and didn't get it when the field was ready. So what'd you do? You use your old one? Or did they send one out? I bought a sprayer. Sprayer is supposed to be there in the spring. 
there's a price tag. It's very important. Yeah, that they sold your trades. I sold mine. Well, oh, you sold yours outright because if it would have been a trade, a guarantee your trade would have come back in the yard. And that was the problem that most of those dealers were facing. They couldn't sell it because they couldn't, they couldn't guarantee the guy to get the, the other stuff. So all of a sudden now, these machinery is starting to show up and all of a sudden they got all this stuff. And one thing that you got to give your credit for from a dealer perspective is, remember we used to talk about floor plans, stuff like that? That's not the way they operate anymore. But wait, tomorrow morning we're going to swoop your account. That's how they do it. So that's the reason that a lot of those dealers are being very aggressive. And again, that's a good thing because how many people here remember in 1988 when all those case tractors suddenly got painted red? Guys, remember that? <laughs> when Tenneco got bought out? And those tractors that got painted red were brand new machines that sat in dealer lots for three years or four years. Maybe, again, I'm aging myself. I was really young when I was 12, but I was paying attention. My point being is that we're, we're not in that environment as we sit here today because they're managing their inventories. And hence the reason for my statement that machinery values are not going to fluctuate very much. As is, Deer, Deer and Case IH and all those guys, they're dealing with their unions, they're dealing with everyone else. They can't lower the prices. They're not. And that's the reason that we're here. And as long as you guys are continuing to, to eat up the demand, because it makes sense, nobody's a better entrepreneur than a farmer, personal opinion, or a risk taker. Well, trust me. Farmers are risk takers. You guys already know that. So keep that in mind as we move forward. Inflation, yes, but slowing. The interest rates are having an effect. 2023, a runout year, but equipment adjustment at some time in the future. Interest rates will affect 2024, but 2020, 2044 is going to be a continuum of a runout. I think that's my last slide. Yeah. Investors holding markets up in the fall of 2023. The realization of interest rates will start taking effect. They haven't yet because there's still too much cash. But that's going to change. The tops are in, at least in the short term. And the generational shift from young people returning to farming hopefully will continue. Again, on my personal experience, I grew up in Arthur, North Dakota. My dad, when I was in high school, I had a brother, Greg, who was year older than I am. We farmed 3,000 acres, had 200 head of stock cows, and my dad had an auction for them. And Arthur, North Dakota, there was 18 boys in the graduating class in 1979, and all but two were farm kids. And guess how many are farming today? Greg Nelson, one, because that was the 80s, right? I don't know, and I don't know if that's going to change, uh, and I think it will, for farm growth, but we aren't going to need as many either. What do you think my dad had six kids for? Your boys. Yeah. Farm ground prices will eventually have to be linked to more of an income uh, issue, and again, that's coming in the future. But again, you guys that are in the farm operation, for gosh sakes, watch your balance sheets. Make sure at the end of the day, when you're farming, it's all about one thing and one thing only, besides keeping the farm intact, profit. You gotta make money, because if you can't make money or if you're not doing it to make money, eventually it's not gonna work. And then, then we're gonna have to have these tough conversations that we used to have in the 80s. We don't have those conversations. 53%, you know, people always say the auction business is good when people go broke or whatever else. It's the, not even remotely closest to being the truth. 54% of everything that we sold this year was sold for ongoing businesses. Okay, and then 24% of it were farm retirements or retirement, and, then, and then about 15% were estates. And even when times are good, people go broke. This is the way it is. And so, but our, our business in that environment, when we do repossessions and all those other companies, last year was like 7%. We just don't. There's, there's not much of that around. And I don't really think that's going to change too much. There'll be a little bit of it. And at the end of the day, people get divorced. People pick up bad habits and wreck their farms. It's always going to be the way it is. So, but right now, things are pretty good. And, you know, from a market change perspective, you guys are in good, good shape. And the agriculture deal, it's an election year. So that should mean a bunch of stuff to you guys. Election years are always good years for ag. And ag always follows oil. So what's oil right now? 74 bucks? Pretty good. It ain't high, it ain't low, but it's pretty good. So there you go. That's my opinion. You can agree or disagree with it. But look for those things as you move forward. And hopefully use this information to make your farms more profitable and to do a better job farming and buy more land and come to more auctions and all those other kind of things. So we used to, about this time of year, we always used to have a paper price guide. 
we don't promotion anymore because cost too much and nobody uses them. So everything's online. And I'll link this up here when you leave. If you scan that QR code, you can get our price guide app for free. It doesn't cost anything. You just got to sign up for it. And it has all of our sales data, on every single piece of machinery that we sold, construction, tractors, combines, balers, whatever it is, on our website. And you can see the price with the pictures, and you can search it and query it and all that, and it's all free. So if you're going to go buy yourself a, a Vermeer's um, tub grinder, chances are you can find a Vermeer tub grinder on the website and remember and see what the last one brought. It's pretty helpful. And it's free. In my world is always about information. Information should be free so we can all make good decisions. And then we can do business together. So we, you guys have a great morning. Thanks for inviting me. It's about 9 30. Does anybody have any questions? Or 10 30. So four, four or five years ago. Four or five years ago, we were told that the reason that prices were increasing was because the investors didn't have any. Place yeah, he's talking about investors being in the farm line four or yeah. five years ago, yeah. which was true. Yeah. So now yeah. you're saying that's irrelevant? Yeah, because the there's no place else to put it. It's what the price is the investors going I can't tell you how many people come to the closing desk table at our deal that are 75 years old, they don't own or they're not a farmer, or they might have a, a, a renter that farms their dad's land, and the renter says, buy this, buy this, buy this, I want to farm it. And they'll, and they'll come up to us and I'll say, well, can I just write a check? And then we got to get us 10% or whatever else. And, and unanimously, and again, I'm, this is what they're telling us. It's not me. What if I have this money? What am I going to do with it? I can't tell you how many times I heard that. It's just, you know, I wish I had that's my, that's my, I'm too much farmer in it. But it's, it's crazy. So there's an answer to the question. Just, they don't know where else to do with their money, and there's still a tremendous amount of loyalty and ties to agriculture, very much so. And you know, the idea that somebody from Los Angeles, California, is going to come buy land north of uh, Devil's Lake and pay 6,500 bucks an acre for it that's probably unrealistic. But a guy from Los Angeles is going to go six miles north of Devil's Lake and buy land for 6,500 bucks an acre because his grandfather came from here, or you're renting it, the land across the road. And you know and say, hey, I'll I'll rent that from you and I'll give you a three percent return. See the difference? There is no magic in the difference. And we're very fortunate here in North Dakota. It blows my mind. I talked to our auctioneer buddies in Indiana and Missouri and Arkansas. How many people want to buy farmland? And the scary part about it, you guys, is is that they don't want to buy a million dollars worth of farmland. Or they don't want to buy a half section or pick something. These people want to spend 50 million. They want to buy 25,000. And they have funds that want to keep around. It's scary. In North Dakota, North Dakota is pretty insulated from all of that. Very much so. But there's so many, so many dollars out there. And again, don't shoot the messenger. But it's just crazy. 